Hi, we are going to speak about the assessment of social communication skills and we'll speak about social communication disorder. So generally, social communication is the ability to communicate effectively with other people and it typically involves an intention or a purpose. And in addition to that, every utterance that we use, we would call a speech act because every utterance that we use, we do something with it. For example, your purpose is to obtain information from someone. So you ask a question, do you do this or do you do that? So the speech act that's involved in the question is eliciting information. There's a whole um, theory called speech act theory that is used for the analysis of uh, social discourse. So social communication is a tool, is a means to achieve a goal. It is a tool for regulating the relationships among people and it, social communication means also that it is language that is used in a particular context because the way that we use language, we modify it based on the context. For example, when you go to your doctor, your doctor's office, you are going to use a particular language, a particular set of vocabulary terms that you are going to use with your doctor even the way that you communicate verbal, nonverbal, and so on, tone of voice. When you communicate with a four-year-old, you are going to use a whole set of, um, uh, say, verbal and nonverbal communication tools, vocabulary, the way that you convey, or the way that you talk, humor, and so on. So, social communication depends heavily on the context. Who are you speaking with? Where are you speaking with? Uh, the timing and, and all other um, situations involved in that context. It requires motivation to communicate. And it is said that people who have autism, they lack the motivation to communicate, for example. And that makes social communication very hard for them. Um, social communication involves the ability to comprehend what people convey to us, messages. Messages now can be verbal. For example, someone saying hi, that's a message. Or can be nonverbal. Someone goes like this, that's a message. Can be a wink, or verbal or non, or nonverbal, or like gestural body language and so on. All of these give messages. So, in order to use social communication effectively, you have to be able to comprehend messages from others. Um, you need to be able to, um, for example, um, to develop speech goals, to develop intentions, purpose, and to use speech acts appropriately. For example, um, you would like to, you know, someone does something for you, uh, what is the best uh, way to thank them? Um, for example, someone says something bad. What do you say? How do you react? So expressive, that's the expressive part of the language. And then reciprocity. It means it's that you presume that communication is a two-way street. You, you do something, someone else does something. So give and take and conversation. You do not dominate the conversation when only communicate with others. Otherwise, there will be a communication failure or a communication breakdown. So the major components of social communication include the intentions and the speech acts. As I mentioned, um, speech acts, every thing that you say based on the purpose for which you say it, that is a speech act. For example, when you go like this, what, what speech act are you uh, making here? Just simply like this. That means a speech act of approval. 
um, or acceptance. What if you say to someone, how are you? What speech act do you, are you conveying here? What is your intention for saying, how are you? It is basically, it means I acknowledge that you are here or I genuinely would like to know how you are doing. For example, and the context is going to make you, um, is going to make the meaning specific now. Now, take the, the, um, greeting. How are you? You're passing, going down, downtown. Someone looks up and then says hi. And then you say hi. How are you? And then you walk. Do you really, when you say in that case, do you say how are you? Meaning that you really want to say how the person is doing. No, it is simply, I'm acknowledging your presence as, as a, what we call them social rituals that are things that we say just to acknowledge and, and move on. But you really, in that case, aren't interested in staying, waiting and having the person explain how their day is going. So that is the intention here of that speech act is a greeting. It is acknowledgement that the person is present and that you have seen that person. Now, let's say someone's mother died and you are going, you see that person the next day and she's a close friend of yours. So you meet her and hug her and, and just look at her and say, how are you? And in that case, is that speech act the same? Even though they are the same words, but the context itself is going to make the speech, the meaning of the speech act, the intent of the speech act is different. So now you genuinely would like to know how the person is coping with her great loss. So the uh, another example of a speech act when, say, um, let's say that you ask someone a question um what did you have for breakfast this morning the speech act is eliciting information so you are using particular words question tools to elicit information for example and it could be why how and so on so there are speech acts that are commands go out of here or, or or go get it get it or come over here these are commands and speech acts could be requests uh, for example um uh, please a request means a modified command a request means using politeness instead of not using politeness so if you command say open the door and if you use a word of politeness, then that you are making the request into a, I'm sorry, making the command into a request. So in the previous one, open the door, you, the speech act is a command. You are commanding or order, ordering someone to, to do something. And then if you say, please open the door, that is a request. You are giving them the, the, the chance. Oh, I'm not commanding you. I'm just saying out of politeness, you know, if you, if you would open the door. And if you also, you could go like to be very polite and say, would you please open the door? So in these cases, again, your intention is going to be the, the, the give the meaning of the speech act itself. So, and I would recommend that you search for Surly, uh, John Surly, uh, S-E-A-R-L-E, -E, and you just say speech act theory, and you will find there's a lot, of, and it is used also in speech language pathology um, quite a bit in uh, social communication, um, uh, you know, assessments and, and analysis. So... Another component is politeness. There are rules of conversation, uh, communication that we, that we follow, even though we do not sit together and say, okay, let's now lay the rules before we can begin communicating. We have established over the years and over millennia 
um, rules for communication that had become acceptable among various communities. And there are, of course, universal, uh, universal, you know, kinds of um, uh, rules. So, in terms of uh, communication, whether uh, written or verbal, I mean, uh, spoken or, or written, we say, um, for example, we use politeness, means of politeness. Would you please, could you please, may I, and so on. So it is taken for granted that um, people would use uh, markers of politeness. The other component is cooperativeness. Cooperativeness is based on reciprocity, based on a two-way street. I am a speaker, you are a listener, and and then I am the listener and you are the speaker or the key, you know, the one who's given me the messages. And cooperativeness is um, was first developed by a language philosopher or philosopher of language, and his name was H.P. Grice. And out of 60 years of studying this, you know, communication systems and so on, he developed that system where speaking about um, about communication having these principles which include politeness and there's another thing called cooperativeness sometimes it's called the cooperative principle so the idea of it I'm going to speak more about it <clears throat> later but the idea briefly is that as you are a speaker or as you, you are the one giving a message. You have to abide by four basic rules. And the first one is called quantity, and then quality, and then third is relevance, and then manner. Quantity means that the speaker shall say or convey, convey the, the idea that he or she has or the message in the least amount of words possible. So if I ask you a question and say, um, for example, did you lock your car? The answer is there is no, it is only either this or that. Did you lock your car? It will be either yes or no. Typically, like practically. And um, so, um, Will you graduate next year? The answer is yes or no. Yes, people get off a little bit and kind of explain a few things here and reasons. There, there's a margin where things are acceptable. But when someone begins telling you a story, when you ask them a yes, no question, there is something wrong. So again, that the person uses or provides only the amount of information that is required to satisfy the listen, the communication needs of the listener. So if you ask me a question, you want one word, you ask me a question with, with say, um, that do you, did you, is, um, did, and so on. And if you want more than one word, then you ask, you, you choose the tool to elicit more than one word. Say, how many, um, for example, how many, um, books have you read over the past uh, two years? So you give, you are giving me a little bit of kind of room to say, Oh, I read five or six. Um, now if you want to know more, you might ask me, tell me a little bit more. Tell me about the books that you read or how or why. So when you ask, you want to elicit uh, more information, you use a tool, a word of a question, uh, I mean, a kind of question that you ask, and that gives me the hint that I have time to give you more information. So again, quantity means that the speaker shall provide only the amount of, um, the amount, the, uh, the um, amount of words or, or amount of information that is required to answer the question uh, that the the listener um, or to answer the needs that the listener, uh, I mean of the listener, sorry. And then quality means 
that what the person says should be taken for granted that it is true to the best uh, um, true and accurate to the best of the person's knowledge and if he or she is not certain they should give some some words there to imply lack of certainty so in that regard for example you ask me is washington the capital of the u.s you know i say yes or if i come to you and say to you <clears throat> for example um seattle is the capital of the u.s so in that regard the quality now is violated because i am giving false information i'm giving either false or inaccurate information for whatever reason some people can uh, may confabulate may make up things um because either because if you know their brain is is not functioning well or intentionally they basically lying so information could be inaccurate could, could be false in, intentionally or unintentionally so the principle of quality means whatever the person says should be accurate and um, true to the best of that person's knowledge and so if i say to you oh the weather is beautiful outside you should take that i mean we take that for granted okay now if for example i am not sure you ask me a question how's the weather out there and i'm not sure i should say well you know i i think um it's it's nice but but don't take my word for it so things like that like i think maybe perhaps and so on these cast a shadow of doubt on what you on what the speaker is saying so that you don't take that as certainty but when the quality principle is broken then the person or people will lose trust in what the person says and we know the story of the the boy who cried wolf that classical story the first time the villagers you know the boy pretended that you know there was a wolf coming to to, to hurt him and the sheep and all the villagers rushed out and they didn't find anything the second time he did it again and all the villagers rushed out and went and he, he was basically uh tricking them the third time he did that there was a, an actual a real wolf and then the villagers say oh <laughs> he's gonna trick us again and th that is when of course the story ends tragically so in other words um when the quality principle is broken then people lose trust in in the credibility um, of that regard and there will be a communication breakdown relevance means that the person i mean the speaker says what the speaker says relates to the topic that the speaker and the listener are engaged in and that the speaker basically stays on topic and doesn't get off track doesn't get off topic manner means that what the speaker says is organized uh, you know sequenced and well organized and it has no ambiguity of any sort and that it is um clear and 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 free of any kind of uh, ambiguity so in that regard you look for cohesion the relationship between a sentence and another and coherence you know that things are sequenced and organized in a logical manner and that there are no ambiguities of any sort like if i say to you samantha went to the store and uh, Alyssa went to the mall that is fine so far there's no confusion so amanda went to the store Alyssa went to the mall she wanted um she couldn't find the ride so she uh took um she, she called an uber so now there's ambiguity because you say you said a listen then you said amanda and then now you are saying she 
What do you mean by she? So the she pronoun here, she, now it could be either one. And now you do not know which one I mean. So that could will cause a communication breakdown. So that is a, an example of when manner is is not followed or the principle of manner is not followed. So these components of cooperativeness and politeness do apply to um, spoken messages. They apply to written messages as well. Written messages could be an email, a text, or, or a letter or anything that you would um, that you would think about. So uh, social communication, of course, um, as speech language pathologists, when we analyze social communication, we tend to focus more on the verbal and um, the um, spoken. I'm saying verbal because verbal means it includes written and spoken, but but spoken is particularly what I'm saying that SLPs tend to focus more on the spoken uh, aspect. Um, and um, if you approach linguistics in, in a comprehensive manner, you should focus on the textual component or the cooperative principle and the politeness principle and the speech acts in written language as well as in spoken language. So, the social communication, the way that it is different than, than language, say, or just, you know, language, for example, uh, skills or language, um, say, semantics and so on, is that social communication has a context. And social communication basically is language in context. And when you put language in context, it comes alive things do happen. So, in order to use social communication effectively, you have to have, you have to have intact neurocognitive abilities. You have to be able to focus attention. You have to be able to, to I mean, your memory skills have to be um, good so that you can switch and, and you can store information and analyze it and so on in your short-term memory and to connect short-term memory with long-term knowledge and so on. So it is heavily dependent on uh, self-regulation, on your ability to make goals for yourself, to have intentions, to, to develop ways to reach these goals, to achieve these goals. So basically social communication is the emergent consequence, the result of the interactions among linguistic knowledge and cognitive abilities and sensorimotor, sensorimotor processes like speaking, uh, bringing you, making your ideas be, you know, translated into movements in, in the case when you speak. It involves, in order to be successful as a social uh, and uh, successful as a social communicator, you have to be able to perceive, to analyze messages, and to filter them out, to filter the information, to to analyze it and find out what is meant by this, what is meant by that. You you have to be able to integrate um, different um, stimuli from different uh, components, for example. Um, let's say that your goal, you, you have an interview and you, the big goal is that you want to get the job. And then they ask you a question and you are going to answer that question. Your go goal for that answer that you provide is to convince them to act, to make, to give you the job. So as you are coming up with the answer, you keep in mind your big goal. You don't want to make a mistake because if you do, you might not get the job. You want to keep in mind on your short-term memory the question that they asked. At the same time, you keep in mind all the answers you gave before in that interview and before you came because you want to be consistent 
what if you had given them uh, you had given them a certain piece of information before and then you come now and you can contradict it that is going to also jeopardize your chances so you also want to in addition to being consistent um you are going to pay attention uh, to the things that you would like to bring up and you choose the timing and so it takes a lot of regulation self-regulation when should you bring up this point when is it appropriate to ask a question and so on and you have to integrate your linguistic knowledge with the social rules and customs that you have learned with the what is knowing what is acceptable in that company or that agency and what is not and so on you need to plan you need to coordinate and to monitor yourself and to monitor again what you say and how you say it and monitor verbal ex i mean um, the facial expressions on the listeners to see what kind of response you are getting when you say something and if they you say something say a word or something that they don't like you are going to immediately try to find the way to to switch and to come up you know fix the situation and your next sentence or next uh, speech act so it requires a lot of monitoring of the context what is going on who you are communicating with and what that person is doing as you are speaking and you are, or you are listening and and monitoring yourself are you nervous should you do this should you do that how are you how about your body language are you using too many gestures should you just lay kind of relax a little bit uh should you use more informal um, body language and and so on so you keep monitoring every aspect of the situation so social communication is a complex skill it's a it is basically um it i would call it neuro pragmatics neuro pragmatics so using your neurological your neurocognitive functions to regulate that language and use that language for the best way and the best way to achieve your goal uh, your social goal whatever that, that is whether to get that job or to convince someone to do something for you or to decline something politely and so on um in addition it in a, uh, social communication involves also the ability to give feedback like someone for example is um, is speaking to you how do you look at yourself what kind of feedback do you give them to imply that you are listening to them do you go uh huh uh huh do you uh, kind of uh, kind of you know think go like that or or do you say words oh would you explain to me again and so there are a lot of things some of them like back channeling sometimes called when someone tells you a story and they say aha uh -huh, wow no oh my god and this all of these are called back channeling it's like feedback that you give to someone to to mean that you are listening or you are approving or you know whatever message that you would you would give so your job when you are not speaking is to to give feedback as well social communication based on that is going to involve a lot of areas in the brain the left side of the brain we know has your syntax your vocabulary it has your um, you know basic comprehension um, of sentences and words and the right hemisphere is going to give you the comprehension in the back and the front anterior is going to give you the ability to comprehend the tone of voice in someone else's speech in an area that is exactly a mirror image of a broca's area but we do not call it broca's area in the right hemisphere we call it the an area analogous to broca's so brokers enables you to make sentences put them in i mean put words into sentences and um works to help you say the sentence the area in the right hemisphere that's analogous to brokers is going to give you the ability to add the right tone of voice into that sentence so you can say it exactly as you mean it um and then in the posterior area 
uh, in the area that is analogous to Wernicke's. So Wernicke's would be somewhere here and the area analogous to Wernicke's in the right hemisphere that is it enables you to comprehend someone else's tone of voice. So um, the right hemisphere also enables you to get the, the message as a whole, the general meaning. For example, you listen to a story, like let's say uh, the story of Aesop's uh, story that's called The Fox and the Sour Grapes. When it goes that there's a fox walking you know, in the forest and then he was really hungry and he looks up and he finds find some a cluster of grapes very nice and really ripe and just you know the best grapes ever so he, he he jumps and he couldn't get them and he jumps again and he couldn't get them he keeps jumping and jumping for a long time and he just gets exhausted and he knows finally that he really cannot get them so he just walks away and says who cares they are sour anyways and we, this is where the saying sour grapes comes from. So it means that, that the moral of the story here means that if there's something you really want to get and you know you cannot get it for whatever reason, that you can't get it, then don't just go and try to spoil it and, and to pretend that it is bad when it really is good and it is the thing that you really want. But you try to hide your own inability and, uh, you know, by saying, oh, they are uh, sour anyways. So that that's the moral in, in, in the story. Moral in the story, for example, of <clears throat> the three little pigs is that if the lesson, moral means lesson, it means it means if you spend time and effort in building something that is solid and good, that is going to last long. It is not going to be a waste of time or a waste of energy or a waste of resources. Things that you build well and spend enough time, you know, they are things that will last and, and will not be easily demolished. So it means, um, in other words, if you want to do something that is good, also it will require more effort and it will require more time. So that is a, a, the lesson, the moral. And you can't get that out of the story when you read it unless you get the information in the left hemisphere the, when you read the story and mix it and integrate it with the information in the right hemisphere and both the front uh, lobes of the right and left hemispheres will work together to calculate all of these things and to give you a comprehensive understanding of what you hear. So we shouldn't be looking at right and left hemispheres as doing, um, you know, working independently. They depend on each other. And in order to, 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 to process something fully, you have to have the integration between both of them and you know to get this material from one part mix it with that and get the input from the other part and then you get a complete image but without that integration you're going to have fractured uh, comprehension if you have comprehension at all so um now let's look at social communication disorder and then we'll go over what it takes to do an evaluation of social communication. So this information is taken verbatim from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, DSM-5. Social communication disorder was first introduced in 2013 and the, when the new edition came, came out. Uh, initially, it was, there was Asperger's disorder and then there were problems with the definition and stuff. So they basically said if someone has any signs of autism, that person will be just would have uh, would be diagnosed with autistic spectrum disorder. And if they have communication problems associated with that, these communication problems, social communication problems will be under will be kind of assumed to be caused by the the autism 
However, um, then this if the person doesn't have autism and they have these social communication problems with no known cause, then that becomes social communication disorder. So in that case, social communication disorder is a disorder of social communication that is not caused by lack of knowledge of language form or structure or language content. So the person will have average, for example, no, what we know as a normal or average or typical um, syntax, semantics, and um, and all the language skills, but the person wouldn't be able to use language and context to communicate socially. So that becomes a social communication disorder. Again, uh, this the, there are people who have social communication problems, but these problems will be sub, will be under the, the main disorder. Like if someone has a head injury, for example, and they develop social communication problems, that will be secondary to the head injury, even though the symptoms are basically could be the same. So social communication disorder is persistent difficulties in the social use of verbal and nonverbal communication as manifested by all of the following. And um, so um, you can read, but I'm going to highlight a few things uh, to explain. So deficits in, in using communication for social purposes, such as getting and sharing information, like getting what do you use, what tools do you use to get information? You use questions. Are you able to choose the right question to ask to get the right information you're looking for? Sharing information. Um, how do you do that? For example, in conversation or email and so on. In a manner that is appropriate for the social context. An example. You're, um, you are sitting and discussing something very serious and, or let's say you are in a funeral. And the situation is really sad. Is that a context? Is it appropriate to, to just go and tell a joke in that regard? So, so even though the wording and everything might, might be okay, but, but the context itself, the place and the time is going to make this really offensive and bad. So, um, the impairment of the ability to change, to, to change communication. I mean, I'm sorry, impairment in the ability to change communication to match the context or the needs of the listener. Um, this is called register. Register means that when you communicate with someone, you choose the language that is best suited for that person. Like say a four year old. You are not going to use complex vocabulary with that four-year-old. You are going to speak slowly. You are going to use basic language. You repeat it several times. And so there are ways and instinctively you are going to know what to use. Uh, if you communicate with a professor, with a doctor, with a lawyer, with a, you know, a judge, a police officer and so on. So you vary and you choose the level of formality or lack or, or informality. Uh, for example, level of intimacy and conversation and so on, based on who you are communicating with. And in addition to that, choosing, changing your communication based on the time, based on the place, and based on anything that may come up. For example, you are speaking about something and uh, that's a private matter and then with a friend and then you look and there's someone else coming towards you. Now, what do you do? The appropriate thing is you don't want to offend the person, and but you also do not want to, re, you know, make the person know what you are discussing. So you might say, okay, you are going to change the topic. So okay, when you come next time, we'll do this and that. Uh, so so you change immediately the, the the communication based on what is happening in the context. Difficulties following rules for conversation and storytelling, such as taking turns in conversation. And that brings us to the, um, the conventions or the cooperative uh, principle, where um, what happens when you tell a story and 
you, you tell too much, you give too much information or too little information, uh, that you are not taking turns, that what you are saying is all this disorganized and so on. Rephrasing when misunderstood. This looks at the ability to um, fix communication breakdowns. When, when I'm talking to you and you say, what, 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 what? That means there's something here, either that I am doing that is making my message not clear or that there's something that you might not have or you might not be doing right to, to get the message right. Let's say you, are, you have a hearing aid, but you have it off. So whenever I say something, say what? So that is because of you, for example. Or I might be kind of, my voice might be uh, lower than I should, than it should be. Or maybe my accent is very heavy. Or so the communication breakdown could be from the speaker or the listener. But it is your job as a listener, as a speaker to monitor the situation. So if you feel that your message, when you evaluate it yourself, is clear, but the other person isn't getting it, then it is your job to fix the communication breakdown. To, to for example, you might rephrase, you might repeat. So you find you might go closer, you might use a pen and write it down. You might use gestures in addition to what you're saying. And children, even 18 months or younger, they can fix communication breakdowns. Like sometimes if you are, um, you are, the ch a baby is talking to you and you are reading a book, they might come and grab the book out of your hand and look at you and say to you what they are saying to, to ensure that they have your full attention. Uh, difficulty under, difficulties, I'm sorry, um, Difficulties understanding what is not explicitly stated, that is implied and inferential statements. And these are particularly hard for people with autism. And difficulty with non-literal or ambiguous meanings of language, like idioms, humor, metaphor, metaphors, multiple meaning words that depend on the, on the context for interpretation. So all of these, the higher functioning semantic skills are hard for people with social communication disorder. The, the deficit, resu the deficits result in, so now these are conditions now. So this is what the disorder should look like. And if someone has these areas, all of them, then you diagnose them with social communication disorder. Now, however, the, for that to be, for you to be able to call this as communication disorder, um, social communication disorder, these conditions also have to be met. The deficit deficits result in functional limitations in effective communication. Functional means, it means that in day-to-day -day usage, a real limitation, for example, in your job, that the social communication is interfering with your ability to do your job. For example, someone calls and you are a receptionist and they call to ask you yes or no and you start telling them stories and giving them lectures. So that, that was going to interfere with your performance. Um, um, also, uh, interfering, the deficits will interfere with social participation that the person might not be able to engage in conversations um, well, and that will limit their ability to have friends and, and to basically make their points uh, conveyed. Social relationships, academic achievement, uh, occupational performance individually or combined. So in other words, these deficits that the person would have must have a direct impact on the person's life in one way or one context or another. And the other condition is that the onset of the symptoms is um, in the early developmental period. In other words, that the, sim that the condition wasn't acquired. It wasn't um, it, it just it, it has a developmental basis that the person was born with this uh, problem. It might be diagnosed later, but that, it, that the person never really developed these skills.
Um, so the symptoms are not attributable to another medical or neurological condition or to low abilities in the demands of word structure and grammar and are not better explained by autism spectrum disorder. So in other words, in order for you to call it social communication disorder, then the person shouldn't have uh, autism and they shouldn't have language uh, problems with language, um, let's say with grammar, syntax or word structure and, and um, uh, language form and language content content um, and they wouldn't have for example intellectual disability or global developmental delay or another mental disorder because if they do then the primary cause of the problem of the communication problem is going to be autism or brain injury or whatever it is so again social communication disorder is strictly the uh, uh, these conditions or these deficits when they are present with in the absence of you know the the other conditions that I that you explained um, so there are some associated uh, features that support the diagnosis sometimes include that the person might some people who have language delays are going to exhibit or are likely to exhibit um some uh, social communication problems and one reason is is that language has a spiral you know kind of way of development if you don't establish the rules of language and the basics it will be not it will not be possible to establish the higher level skills avoidance of social interactions the person might have social anxiety for example and that will cause contribute to the social problem social communication problems adhd especially the hyperactive kind type they many people have um, uh, inappropriate social communication skills behavioral um, disorders uh, specific learning disability even tourette syndrome that it kind of uh, it has a, a pragmatic or a social communication uh, deficits associated with it and for example there are tics that people repeat that involve swearing and saying profanities and so on even though the person um, I mean uh, the, the person with threats would say that they are part of the of the disorder itself and that had you know has been medically confirmed as well so um, okay the again in order to diagnose the social communication disorder um, you need to to rule out autism spectrum disorder a diagnosis of a social communication disorder should be considered only if the developmental history fails to reveal any evidence of restricted repetitive patterns of behavior interests or activities because these are hallmarks of autism so if someone um, doesn't have these and they have the social communication deficits, then that will be called social communication disorder. Uh, social communication disorder can coexist with disorders other than autism, for example, like speech disorders, um, uh, learning disorders, intellectual disorders. So again, these um, th these disorders, uh, the list here includes um, the list includes disorders that oftentimes cause or are associated with uh, social communication problems. But in that case, the social communication problems will be secondary to these main disorders like autism, uh, autistic spectrum disorder, uh, traumatic brain injury cerebrovascular accidents like strokes uh, right hemisphere damage uh, can be caused by either uh, prefrontal cortex damage if someone has a like say car accident that that affects the frontal lobes of the brain that will also cause pragmatic difficulties social communication problems but that again will be secondary to the the primary disorder which is 
or, or the primary diagnosis, which is TBI or CB. ADHD in some cases, especially, like I said, the hyperactive type and uh, hearing impairment as well, uh, specific language impairment and Tourette syndrome. Uh, here I'm going to mention a few things quickly speaking about the development of social communication and to give you the idea that you can evaluate social communication very early in life, even in the first year of life. So it, it requires skills and it requires that you understand the, develop, the development of social communication. But again, I'm just going to, to speak about a couple of things that are critical to social communication development. We begin development uh, social communication skills um, at birth. Uh, basically, um, the, the brain, the baby is born with a brain that has a networks in rough draft. And the environment is going to bring in stimulation, sensory stimulation that is going to make either the rough drafts connected more solidly or to modify them and, and dismantle, you know, them and, and bring in shape, you know, other networks, established networks that will make the person better suited to the environment that he or she finds herself in. So everything is going to depend on what stimulation do you get? What do you see around you? What do you hear? What do you touch? What do you feel? All of this is going to stimulate. It will make our neurological system and sensory mechanisms fire. And when they fire, they connect. And when they connect, they make networks that these networks will, will store the information from the experience. And that information, then we can use it as we go about our lives. So social communication depends heavily on visual stimulation, on auditory stimulation, um, and um, many other sensory mechanisms. Uh, the ability to acquire social emotional uh, skills, that is significant, that's a big part of social communication. Um, children, uh, so very little children, newborns, they begin learning social communication through the interaction uh, with the adults. For example, the baby in the first couple of weeks, they learn that when they cry, they are going, they, someone is going to come and help them. So they will learn that, la that crying is a language, is a means of communication so that they can achieve their goal. Um, the, um, at that period of time, uh, newborns and young children generally, uh, rely a lot on, um, kind of unconscious types of memory in order to kind of take in information, store it in these kinds of memories. And these are memories that you can't declare memories that we are not aware of. And, you know, very early in life, we use these memories to develop, like, for example, uh, things that we like, things that we don't like. Uh, we uh, kind of feel close to cer certain people and we feel like we don't like, you know, certain people and so on. So these become basically form our likes and dislikes in, in the early childhood. There are critical periods in development and social communication particularly has critical periods. And um, the, these critical periods or they occur mostly in the, in the developmental years, early years from birth to age three or, or may, maybe uh, birth to about five or so, but most consistently from birth to age three years. And the idea that critical periods are windows in time where you must provide specific stimulation of a certain kind for a cer certain sensory channel so it can connect and it can enable the person to develop skills in that area. 
so in terms of um, social communication, these social communication skills, for example, um, they develop through routines and through conversation and play and interaction with adults and, and also with children of the same age and seeing other children interact and, and basically looking and observing and also having the environment where the child can experiment and can use social skills without feeling threatened or without feeling interrupted and so on. However, in some cases, when there are adverse effects that, you know, for example, so uh, that will affect social communication, these effects might not be reversible and the person might live throughout life with social deficits. So, and again, this is from um, the principles of neural science by Kendall and others. And um, so research shows that in some cases, the adverse effects of deprivation or atypical experience early in life cannot be easily reversed by providing appropriate experience at a later stage. Which means that, for example, if there's abuse or neglect, uh, or simply that the person is not, doesn't have the experiences, is not exposed enough to social communication in their environment, then that is going to lead to limitations and that these limitations could last throughout the person's life, even if you try to provide the help later in life that the person will continue. Again, the idea of critical periods in light of what we know today with neuroscience and advances and all of this, uh, there is a hope that this might be reopened in certain ways. But as we know now, the um, deprivation, abuse, neglect, lack of interaction with the child in the early um, years is going to cause serious social communication problems. So the first six months of life are really critical. Just go to your language acquisition book, especially Owens, and go through the sensory neural development, look at the um, motor development, look at memory and, and cognitive and neurological development and see the stages and see what what should um, what the children at six months of age should have. And they basically um, should, are highly, highly interactive social beings. And if the person doesn't really receive the adequate stimulation uh, through playing, through um, speaking, through mothers or interaction using that kind of um, emphatic uh, language that we use with babies, then the person will not develop appropriate social communication skills. Um, the, call, the, the problems if someone doesn't have the experiences, then the effect at that time might not be reversible. That means even if you provide the help later, that the, the person is not going to do as well. Um, the impact of social deprivation, when we say social deprivation means that you don't spend enough time with the child interacting, using language, playing games, making the child laugh, and all of, you know, basically stimulating the child through communication, then the child will, um, could develop some of these symptoms, you know, or all of them. Social withdrawal, that means that the child will not have the desire to kind of be with others or communicate with others. Decreased curiosity, uh, decreased joyfulness and playfulness, global developmental delays, emotional cognitive language and motor deficits, immune system suppression, uh, proneness to infections because that all of this causes stress and stress reduces immune system functions and that makes the baby prone to infections. And that you know when they have infections that will promote uh, middle ear uh, problems and that will affect language. It will lead to a whole sequel 
of things. Deprivation is correlated with the structural brain abnormalities. For example, the more severe the, the deprivation is, the greater the changes in the brain are going to be. In terms of temperament, children very early in life are going to be able to assess their temperament very early in life. For example, negative childhood uh, child temperament is characterized by short attention span. When the baby looks at you, the baby is not going to look as uh, for a, as long a time. When they interact, taking turns and so on, very early, three months or, or and above, they will have a short attention span compared to other babies their age. They are um, quick uh, emotional reactivity. It means that if the baby uh, cries um, and you don't go immediately, the baby will immediately start to continue crying even after you come. The baby will continue crying, will be very hard to soothe. Uh, excessive motor activity, that eventually could lead to the um, hyperactivity that we see as the baby grows. So these are things easily can easily detect early. And if you see them, you know that that is going to lead to social communication problems. Uh, positive child temperament uh, from uh, between six months and 12 years, uh, 12 months, it's characterized by orient, orienting toward parent it means when the parent is is going to come and look at the baby the baby looks at the parent if the parent goes away the in the baby follows the parent with eye gaze the baby can be easily soothed like when they cry then you go for to help them then they immediately stop crying uh, they smile a lot when you try to engage them and play with them they exhibit uh, better vocabulary by age 21 months because you know all of these positive temperaments are going to make the baby of course more appealing to all kinds of people they will try to interact and that is going to and the baby himself or herself is going to elicit a lot of interaction through in their own way so that is going to stimulate their uh, visual mechanism, auditory mechanism, and motor uh, skills. So in order for a child to develop appropriate social and behavioral skills, they must, number one, they must have adequate contact with others. They need to at least interact on a regular basis with at least two adults on a regular basis, and they must see these two adults as trustworthy as uh, people who they you know who they feel safe around so that when they communicate they are given all the time they need and they enjoy the communication with these people and also they must have the ability they must be able to observe other children and they must be able to interact with other children um, so these are conditions that are critical for the development of social emotion, uh, social communication and social emotional development. Two basic conditions. Now, it is important to understand that when, say, a parent, a mother particularly, uh, has depression or has um, especially depression, uh, that is going to have an impact, a serious impact on the child if the mother is not aware particularly. And the reason is that the baby needs frequent stimulation. They need to continue, play throughout the day and to read and to be enter, kind of to, to engage with the baby and have the baby laugh and, and giggle and, you know, read with them and all of this. So a parent who has depression or stress uh, under chronic stress will not be able to interact as much. We might not have the desire to interact. And if they have the, the, the time, they, they might not always exhibit the, the pleasure in interacting with the baby. And the baby will internalize that and that will, will uh, you know, affect the baby negatively. Decreased maternal responsiveness. Uh, people who have depression usually they just like to be by themselves and they don't want to 
to interact much with others and their communication is affected. Even the tone of voice is flat and it's not animated and it's not, you know, doesn't have that happiness and pleasure <coughs> that the baby needs to feel, you know, for example, that the, 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 the other side is motivated to communicate with him or her. Decreased physical stimulation. So all of this is going to affect the child. Remember, babies rely on unconscious memories um, a lot to internalize social and, and other uh, functions. Uh, the baby, in, in, in when we have parents, especially mothers, um, showing these uh, symptoms, then the baby is likely to have poor receptive vocabulary because of the decreased communication with the baby, shorter, less this descriptive narrative when the baby is a preschooler or, or later when they start to tell stories they wouldn't have much to tell uh poor social responsiveness when someone asks them a question or makes a comment and so on they would have difficulty responding appropriately um so the uh, parent may be unable to use mother ease mother ease if you when you review your um the characteristics of mother ease it has an, a high inflation uh, a highly inflated tone like uh, high pitch and you repeat and it's and you do a lot of playing with the words and and people who have women who have depression are gonna find it hard to use mother ease effectively and sincerely the parent may not be able to communicate and or read as frequent as frequently with the child the desire might be diminished so again when you read you have to have like your voice should be inflected a kind of you do the inflections of based on the characters and based on the humor and and all of this to make the baby excited about what they are reading and that is going to be impaired because of the mood disorder in the parent and that will make the, the baby unable to fully comprehend the emotional prosody and the emotional content of the language in the story that they read. So implications, when you do the assessment with a very young child, uh, or generally, you need to, um, your case history should explore the nature of the child's environment who the child is living with, how frequently do they communicate, what kind of activities do they play, how does the routine uh, of the baby's day go, uh, what, uh, you know, for example, does the, what, what activity, what do you do when the, you, the baby wakes up from the nap, uh, for, for example, what do you do when the baby takes a bath, uh, what do you do when you feed the baby, uh, how does the baby spend her time, you know, most of the day, and so on. Uh, the family dynamics, is there a divorce in the family? Is there, uh, does the mother have uh, mood disorder, um, for example? Is there violence? Is there all of these mechanisms you have to assess because they will affect the child one way or the other. Who the child socializes with? Uh, the mental status, again, of the caregiver, quality and quantity of the interactions, how frequently, how many times do you play games with the child, how many times do you read with the child, how um, how long when you, for example, the baby wakes up from a nap and you, you kind of give him five minutes or so and then you start to play, how long do you play with the child, how long do you read, um, play skills also, do you play pretend play with the child uh, does the child have uh, access to other kids when when they start to play together as like you know play uh, pretend play uh, your questions again should be open-ended so that if you ask a question yes no you are likely to get little information you need to make your questions open-ended and focused on things that could cause a social communication problem so in that case, make your questions pointed um, and maybe even indirect because you don't want the parents to feel guilty as well about, um, you know, uh, a, a, a situation when the child is having um, social communication problems. You need to ask about the child's health. 
uh, sleep patterns. If the child is not sleeping well at night, he or she is going to have a tough time in the day uh, staying uh, awake, and that's going to impact their cognitive abilities and the ability to monitor uh, the situation when they communicate. Uh, if the child has upper respiratory infections, that's going to have uh, an effect on the status of the eustachian tube. It will cause middle ear infections and then language problems. And um, it also uh, will likely uh, cause um, problems with the adenoids because upper respiratory infections very commonly occur, cause um, adenoid hypertrophy or enlargement. And that could cause uh, sleep apnea, and then sleep apnea could cause sleep deprivation in addition to oxygen problems. So in effect, the person is going to have um, a mood problem in the day because they didn't sleep enough in the night before, and they would feel like kind of they are not really in the mood to communicate with others and they don't have the desire to be with others and they are grumpy and angry all the time. So if a child comes close to them, they might push the child. And many of these children are, are labeled as bullies because of, you know, they can't, hand, they don't know how to handle their behavior. Uh, but basically, if you fix that problem, the adenotonsillar problem, um, that is going to fix the behavior at some point. Head injuries also are very important uh, because if the person had head injuries, they wouldn't have the neurocognitive abilities to regulate their social communication. Uh, medications that they are taking. So here is the adenoids, as, as you could see, and behind the adenoids, you will find uh, one side eustachian tube here. So this could, could grow as big as a golf ball and it could cause obstruction in the velopharyngeal port and then the person can, that will not be able to breathe and then take oxygen as much as a result they breathe through the nose and but when they are sleeping then the person is going to have sleep apnea when basically they stop breathing and they keep waking up and stop breathing keep waking up some of them might lose more than 30 percent of sleep time so that is a condition that you have to really mind and, and, and kind of ask. Uh, uh, also, uh, look at the mood and emotional problems in the child or in the, in the mother particularly, uh, as depression has been increasingly diagnosed in very young children. And then mental flexibility, you want to see if the child um, accepts other solutions. For example, um, the child wants a sticker of a certain kind. What if we don't have a sticker, a green sticker? Will the child be happy with a red one? Will the child be happy with something else? You know, or is it that I want this and I want it now and there is no uh, solution if you don't get it? You know, the baby is very upset. Uh, what do you do if the routine is broken? You can get this information from the parents. Also, um, mental flexibility. Um, you can look at it as um, does the baby accept, you know, for example, other solutions? What if the child, uh, say in a school system, if you remove their seat to a different side of the table, or uh, if you don't, for example, provide the way uh, services in exactly the same way, how will the child be? So mental flexibility means that you are able to accept other solutions. You are able to accept things. You know, if I want something. If it is not there, I could take something else instead of it. Um, so mental rigidity is the opposite. And people who have mental rigidity tend to do things in the same way, no matter what. Even when you they make a mistake and you correct that mistake, they keep going back to the same old uh, mistake that they make, even after you provide multiple corrections. So that is called perseveration, going back and doing the same thing over and over, regardless of knowing what is right and what is wrong. So implications for um, assessment then 
uh, functioning in, in the school environment, for example, when you look at, you evaluate the child. Um, ask a child, who is your best friend? Because that's a good uh, question. Everyone's going to have a, a best friend. Usually it's just one. But if you get, oh, I have many friends, that means the child doesn't have a best friend. Uh, ask for the teacher's input, for example. And you have the self five uh, pragmatics profile or questionnaire that can be completed by the teacher. I, I usually have the teacher and, and the parent. Each one, I give them the form and I rate each one of them. And then I kind of see how, how different they are. Is the child using more skills at home than at school? Or is the child using more skills in the school than in the home? And I kind of, you know, get the input from both because these are two different contexts. And in the school, there, there's, there are many children to communicate with in the family. Maybe there are, maybe they aren't uh, children and so on. Um, look for organization of, um, of expressive output. When the child says something, how organized is their verbal output, uh, spoken or written, uh, clinical observation. Write notes about, um, for example, how the child is behaving, uh, say in the cafeteria, in the playground, in the classroom, uh, and if you, you know, can do a home visit in the home or have them do a, uh, record the video, for example, when the child is communicating normally, spontaneously. The, um, Standardized and non-standardized testing that you use uh, for social communication assessment, um, you are going to have to look at s multiple areas. You want to know how the neurocognitive abilities are. The neurocognitive abilities that will enable a person to use language appropriately, to use social communication and to regulate social communication effectively. For example, attention, work and memory skills, uh, problem solving. Um, you want to assess language content and language form, semantics, uh, morphology, syntax, to make sure that they are okay. Knowledge of social customs and conversational rules. Um, this you can do with formal testing. I'm going to tell you what you could use. An application of social customs and conversational rules. So the formal testing that you get, standardized testing, is going to tell you what the person has in their mind, okay? Their knowledge that they internalized. And you want to also know to the extent to which the person is applying these this knowledge in when they communicate with others. So functional. So <clears throat> all of this functional component application depends on things that are not standardized. You collect the information about this from your clinical observation, from your own testing that you do. You, you design some test, testing tasks and you ask the person some questions to gather information about how they apply the, uh, this knowledge. And also the parental and teacher questionnaires uh, like the self questionnaire, for example, does the child do this or does the child do that? And you can see in the real world how the child is behaving at home and in school. So all of this, when you analyze this information and you compare it to the formal testing, like say the castle subtest on pragmatics or the social uh, language, uh, the social, um, language uh, test you are going to say oh the the formal testing shows that the person knows the skills but in formal testing or you know the throughout the evaluation and the information collected from the parents and the teachers show the, shows that the child is not applying um uh, a lot of what the child knows for example. So they are not contradictory. They are complementary. <clears throat> so to test problem solving, 
there you could do um, a test for example the test of problem solving um, in elementary uh, or the test of problem solving uh, adolescent so either one based on the age that you have for attention as SLPs we do not test attention however um, because of the involvement of of social communication um, and how uh, we mentioned some disorders make you know uh, are known to have to result in social communication problems most likely you might have a, a report from a psychologist clinical psychologist or um, neuropsychologist uh, a neurologist uh, or someone who evaluated the child and look at their attention skills you could take these scores and report them and then trans uh, interpret your own scores and your own results with reference to that for example if the person has difficulty taking turns and then you look and they have an attention score that or attention skills that are severely decreased then you could say oh the child is having difficulty taking turns because uh, of the severely or significantly decreased attention span. Um, work in memory skills. You can also get that from uh, the psychological report or from uh, the neuropsychology report. Um, you can, if you don't have it, then you could administer um, some testing in that to get information about this one. I'm going to show you um, some suggestions executive functions you could do a test of executive functions the for example um, this test the executive functioning test um, looks at um, the ability to develop goals and and basically self-regulation skills and if someone has poor self-regulation skills most likely they will have poor social communication skills uh, you assess informally by through your observation, behavioral control and inhibitory con or inhibitory control. For example, um, if someone doesn't have that, they would be impulsive. Before you say something, they interrupt you in the middle of the sentence. So does the person interrupt? Is the person able to, to wait until someone finishes what they are saying and then they answer the question? Uh, if they want to do something, do they just immediately, impulsively go? So look for signs of impulsiveness. And if there are, then the person will have difficulty with inhibitory control. You could also glean some information from about this from the neuropsychological report. And if you feel the, the case is very, very involved and there is no psychological report, you should refer them for a neuropsych eval. Uh, self-monitoring again self-monitoring is just another name for executive functioning and then theory of mind so all of these are cognitive skills neurocognitive skills that are known to have an impact on social communication these are the things like the engine that we use to facilitate the use of social communication so theory of mind um, is, is the ability to take someone else's perspective. And it is known that people who have autism have si significant difficulty with theory of mind. And there are other populations as well. So that should be a, um, a big part of, uh, a part of your assessment as well. So first, you begin kind of building a mini, a mini neurocognitive profile, a profile you know that that you do because you want to differ, do differential diagnosis so uh, look at the psycho psychological reports or neuropsychology reports uh, or neurology reports that you have any that you have you should look for uh, scores on uh, attention on inhibitor control and executive functions and also work in memory if you have all of this information already that's going to make your job easier because you will use that information to justify, say, oh, there's a, a deficit here and it is related to this. There's a de deficit there, it is related, it is caused by that. And again, if you don't have that, you should develop yourself as much as you can and then also refer. So 
uh, when you look at work and memory skills, there is a test that is called automated work and memory assessment by basically the person who is just a remarkable person in terms of uh, one of the founders of a lot of the research on work and memory, Alan Batley. So this test was developed directly with input from him by one of his students and it is um, online and I mean, you have samples online, but it is available if, if your corporation or whatever wants to buy it or you can use it. Um, there's also, so that is going to look at work and memory as a whole. Work and memory has two components. One component tests the ability for you to do two things at once. Um, and also short term memory. Short term memory, you can assemble some subtests from different batteries and you can administer um, you can get a work and memory profile for example uh, you look at digits forward one two three you look at did um, words also recalling words and you look at recalling sentences and there are also you could do sentence comprehension to get some kind of uh, uh, information about recalling stories. There's also the child memory scale that will have assessed the ability to recall stories. But even if you do digital digits forward, notice forward only, like one, five, two, three, now repeat them in the same way, five, two, three words, and then sentences, then you could, that will be sufficient for a short term memory or a uh, kind of uh, a score for this you could do the test of auditory perceptual i had it, auditory perceptual um uh, uh skills taps three is gonna have uh digits recall and word recall and sentence recall the self five only has the sentence recall so you can take these three from the taps three or uh, digits and words and also you can get the recall from self, the self. I mean that will save you like 15 minutes if you don't have to do it this way because the self five is is part of the of the core you know the the, the sentence recall is part of the core of the self so instead of administering two subtests that assess the same skill you could probably do digits and words from the auditory from the taps and you could do sentence recall from the self five so you kind of look at these because if they are decreased that is going to have an impact on uh on social communication skills so when you go back and say oh the child couldn't do this or couldn't do that because they their work and memory is decreased or their attention is span is very limited and so on they, they couldn't do it to take a turn for example um a theory of mind the there are stories that are called false belief stories these are typically used to evaluate theory of mind theory of mind is a, briefly social perspective taking so theory of mind means that you formulate an idea about someone's mind and you figure out how they are thinking and how for example do they feel in, re, in response to what you are saying so all of your knowledge of how they think and knowledge of their background and their knowledge is going to enable you to communicate with them effectively for example you wouldn't say something to offend them you would not for example do um, tell them something they already know or tell them something that uh, so to assess theory of mind um, we use stories called false belief stories and one example here for example is when you get a say an empty cheerios box and you put a banana in inside of it and close the box you ask the person what's in the box and the person will say uh, for example uh, you, you know most likely they will say cheerios 
but then when you show them what's in the box they find out that there's a banana then you ask them so if your sister comes in say your sister wasn't here she doesn't know what's in the box if she comes in what do you think she's going to say is in the box and then if the child doesn't have well-developed theory of mind he or she is going to say oh she's going to think there's a banana in the box and the reason is because the child knows already they think that everyone like them knows what's in the box they have difficulty getting to the other person's mind and imagining knowing that the other person wasn't here and having difficulty imagining that the person doesn't know what is in the box so uh, by four years of age the child should know uh, there is a test here if you click on this is the uh, theory of mind inventory it's a test that's a new test that came out a year ago or so and um, it's supposed to be a good one and there's also a video here that shows you uh, how uh, false belief stories work and how you evaluate theory of mind and there's another link that you could look at for four more uh, resources so um, this all have to do with the assessment of the neurocognitive skills that are required for the regulation of social communication again social communication is a complex kind of uh, communication and if someone has difficulty with any of these social um, neurocognitive skills they will likely have problem with social communication now we come to the assessment of language form and language content or language structure and language content but so the first aspect that we discussed so we can take out of the way you collect the information about these skills from your case history and from your interaction with the uh, the client and through your clinical observations so you look for the tone of voice is it adequate for what the child is is saying is the child able to express appropriate tone of voice to say convey excitement convey questioning conveying uh, answering a question and so on is now the other part of it is receptive is the child able to comprehend the tone of voice of others when you say ask a question um, is the child able to understand the question because of from your tone of voice for example is the child able to understand your tone of voice uh, say when you are um, or is the child able to understand tone of voice of someone who's angry or someone who's excited or someone who is sad and so on the ability to comprehend gestures and the ability to express gestures the uh, look at facial expressions the ability to exhibit facial expressions that are consistent with what the ch with what the person says and expressive uh, receptively the ability to comprehend facial expressions of others and you all collect this information from um, different sources and there are also um, tests that evaluate facial expressions as well body movement uh, body language eye contact and proxemics uh, proxemics has to do with how close you are when you communicate with others do you invade their personal space uh, do you um, keep a, an appropriate distance when you communicate with them uh, so all of these things you gather through the clinical observation and the notes that you have and then you administer any battery to to get um, a core language um, language score for example you look at morphology and syntax semantic abilities you need to to, to um, you need to um, evaluate receptive vocabulary expressive vocabulary synonyms and antonyms multiple meaning words all of these um, are critical as a foundation 
for a higher level semantic skills, which include inferences, uh, non-literal meaning, understanding information based on the context, idiomatic exp expressions. And most of these tests you could find in the castle, but you can combine subtests from the castle and the self or subtests from any, you know, tests together to assemble a battery. Uh, you evaluate vocabulary, expressive receptive, um, I mean, PBBT4 and EBT2, that could get you uh, the, the basic vocabulary, expressive and receptive testing. <coughs> Owls, cell 5, castle, or any battery basically that, that gives you the basic content and form um, areas. And then, now you focus on after that, you get to the social component of the language. Um, you want to evaluate the knowledge. How, you know, if the person knows the, the rules and customs and, 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 and the, for example, that are used by the community uh, at large, their ability to use the register, uh, shifting the tone of voice and the vocabulary and the language that you use based on who you communicate with, uh, based on where you communicate and the context, basically, as I explained earlier, how the person uses politeness markers, please, may I, could you, and so on. Uh, uh, social um, rules. So to assess the, all of this knowledge, you can simply get the, P, uh, the pragmatics questionnaire of the self five, and that is, you uh, give it to the teachers, to the parents as well, and each one um, uh, does their own assessment. And then you get a score in the end, and you have some kind of a, some kind of a, you know, ballpark figure. To, you go to a chart, and that will tell you some kind of an age equivalent there, criterion actually. It tells you if this is, consistent with the age or not and then and so that tells you the usage actual usage and in addition to that you get your clinical observation and the questions that you yourself ask and combine them with that to see how the person is actually using the skills that they know in functional uh, uh, communication contexts and then you also want to administer uh, something like the test of social language development or the Castle 2 pragmatic judgment subtest. So any one of this is going to tell you how much the person knows here and what they know. And again, when you compare this to the questionnaires and to your own observation, you will be able to see that the person, for example, is able to use most of what they have or not using anything of what they know or maybe they don't have the skills in the first place. So if they don't know the rules, they're not gonna be able to have anything to apply. So these again uh, are the, you know, focusing directly on the so, uh, social use of the language. So remember again, the standardized tests are gonna show you uh, the extent to which the pragmatic rules have been internalized and then they do not tell you if the person is actually using these skills in day-to-day um, in -day communication. The uh, other ways to get information about these aspects, about the application, is using language samples. If you get about maybe three verbal samples from different contexts, maybe the house, maybe uh, uh, the playground, the classroom, somewhere else, and then merge, uh, tally them into table in the table, and make them as one component, and then anal you know get say three hundred utterances or so, or maybe even two hundred utterances, and then analyze them, count the syllable. I mean, sorry, we don't do that. Um, analyze them in terms of uh, the criteria that I'm gonna show you. In, in a few minutes so. and then you will tell if there is you know uh, adequate usage or not in, in these samples and also you are going to 
apply to these samples you are going to apply these uh, analyze them in terms of quantity quality relevance and manner so before i um, get into these i'm going to show you some like a simple tool that i have developed uh, to augment or, or to, to to assess how the person basically uses these uh, skills okay so this is a uh, basically some a combination of all clinical observations and some questions that I asked the person directly and for example uh, a checklist for myself uh, the child plays cooperatively with peers yes no uh, the child generally is polite in the classroom it makes appropriate requests politely using politeness markers please may I uh, initiating conversation with others uh, and uh, during activities using politeness markers offering help to others for example may I help you uh, would you like me to help you placing uh, being able to place an order in a restaurant uh, the child for example is able to make an implicature or can make an implied statement so um, all of this you can get from your conversation with the child throughout the evaluation and from the case history, from the questions that you get from the parent. Uh, language economy or the quantity, quantity that I'm going to speak about when someone doesn't have, someone has difficulty looking, uh, giving the right amount of information, then they would have problem with language economy. So the, uh, do I question myself, do the, does the child provide appropriate uh, and the appropriate amount of information as requested by other conversational partners for example if i ask you yes or no question do you give me a yes or no answer or tell me a story um, and i to evaluate this i make a list of questions here simple questions and i have a, some questions for younger and some for older so for example do you like running the answer is yes or no are bears always black uh, did it rain yesterday do you play baseball do you have a dirt bike do you have a cat at home all of this you know the answer is yes no yes no and if the, the person gives you um uh, like tells you stories or doesn't tell you yes or no in about half of the questions or maybe um 40 percent then there's something wrong there there's there, there is a problem with language economy and how will that affect the person's performance that means the person will have a person who has difficulty or a person who gives you more than what you are looking for that that will their language will be redundant they will be repeating themselves they will be telling you things you do not need to know uh, they will be distracting and um, people will try probably to avoid them because every time you just meet the person for a minute or if they call you on the phone um, you know that they will take forever to, to to end or if you want to ask a simple question you know you're gonna get a lot of stories so that is definitely going to cause social problems and um, so again um, these questions are easy to ask and uh, you can observe throughout your um, interaction with the person how they do um, then in terms of uh, also how will that affect uh, their performance in daily life in the classroom for example when they write about something say they are writing an essay or a story they are likely to, to repeat a lot of the stuff that they are speaking about. Uh, they are likely to uh, be repetitive and to get off topic because if you speak, you know, uh, give a lot too much information, you are likely to, to divert from, from the topic. So all of this is going to have an impact on their academic performance that will show as lack of organization, a uh, lot of redundancy, a lot of stuff that is said that should not be said it's not needed uh, so 
you want to evaluate each one and immediately say how it, it affects the, perf the performance in school and in the society, in daily life. You want to see um, how the person is able to inhibit his or her own um, self. For example, do they interrupt? Are they impulsive? And the, the observe and, and gather information about this from observation and from your teachers and the parents. You look at um, also how the person um, the, the person's output, verbal output. The, when they, for example, um, they want to speak about something, is the person able to introduce a topic? Oh, last weekend I went and did this and that. Uh, if they are interacting in a small group, are they able to introduce a topic for conversation? Are they able to terminate the topic and switch to another topic appropriately? Demonstrating the appropriate, uh, I mean, demonstrating appropriate turn-taking skills during a game or during conversation. Uh, you need, you can get this informally using uh, appropriate re register with the teacher and the peers. Do they speak to the teacher with respect, with politeness? Do they use different vocabulary with the teacher uh, as compared to the peers? Using syntactic, syntactic patterns to convey meaning appropriately, that's grammar. Uh, can they interpret the speaker's speech acts? Like, for example, I'm going to say, uh, can you count from 1 to 10? That's an implied request. So the person, oh, yes, I can, and they don't do it. Uh, that means that they have difficulty comprehending implied requests. Understanding meaning of facial expressions and commonly used gestures. Uh, you collect this information from the self-questionnaire and from your own observation and the teacher's reporting. Uh, is the person able to make appropriate eye contact? Uh, is the pers person able to demonstrate assertive communication behavior? Assertive doesn't mean aggressive. Assertive means, should, can I raise my hand and ask you a question? If I want to make a request, do I have the courage to do that? Should I tell you, uh, I, I'm sorry, could I go to the bathroom or this and that? Making your needs known. In other words, and if you feel, uh, for example, uh, that you have a demand, that you could make that demand self-advocate. Uh, how is the person able to relate to the feelings of others? For example, uh, one simple thing is, yeah, say Samantha lost her cat. How do you think she feels? That is one, but I'm more interested in this. What can you do or what can you say to make her feel better? That is social communication. Uh, Max did not pass his math test. How do you think he feels? Okay, what can you do or say to make him feel better? So using social communication to comfort others. So things uh, like, um, for how do you know that someone is angry, for example? Um, understanding implied utterances. Uh, can you rub your head with your hand? If the person says, yeah, I can, and they don't do it, then that means they have difficulty understanding implied utterances. Uh, another one is Amy and her mother were watching TV. Mother said, oh, the volume is so low, I can, I can barely hear it. Then why did mother say that to Amy? So that means if the person doesn't have the ability to understand it, they would have difficulty understanding implied references, inferences or imp implied utterances or inferences. And the same, these are just longer. And uh, for example, one story is Matt met his favorite teacher in the hallway. She asked him about his weekend. Matt told her that he had gone to the movies and that he began telling her about the movies that he watched. And he started telling her in detail, of course. And as he was talking to her, uh, she kept looking at her watch. One of the children I administered this to, he said, when I said, is there anything wrong in the story? He said, yes. There is. What? Said the teacher is rude. Why? She was looking at, at her watch while he was telling her the story. And that, of course, that child had a lot of social communication problems. So what should Matt have done now? You should have read the cues. 
you should have not told the story, you know, and knowing that the teacher is busy and, um, and the other story is just like that. So these are, um, you know, things that I have. And when I do pragmatic uh, social communication assessment, I administer that. You could, you could develop your own uh, similar to that. You could even make it better. Okay. So then, um, in order not to make the, the videos is really getting long. So what I will do is, um, I'm going to keep the next part in a separate video to show you how I use the cooperative principles, the elements or the components of the cooperative principle, and how do I use them functionally to analyze someone's conversation. So I'm going to stop this one here, and I'm going to, um, the next one is going